There we go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Except now I lost my speaker notes here. <laughs> but maybe we can do bloop. There, there we go. Now I'm really here. Hi, everyone. I'm here to tell you to stop using JavaScript. Yes. <laughs> so usually I, I give this talk to like a full stack audience. So I have this little caveat here that says, who boy? Of course, that's not needed here. It's hooray. <laughs> so who am I? I'm Killian. Uh, I spent the past 20 years building websites in all manner of technologies. I am part of the Electron governance team. If you're unfamiliar with Electron, it's a framework to make desktop applications using web technologies. So it basically takes Chromium and Node and mashes them together. It's great. I built Polypane in it, which is a browser for developers. And this is what Polypane looks like. I'm not going to discuss it anymore. I just want to mention that uh, because Working on Polypane means that I write bucket loads of JavaScript all day, every day, like obscene amounts of JavaScript. So you could actually say I love JavaScript. But I also really like CSS and I even like HTML a lot. <laughs> Usually here I switch this out because it's content editable, but to annoy everyone here, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> So the reason I love all three of these technologies is something called the rule of least power. It's one of the core principles of web development. And it means that you should choose the least powerful language for a given purpose. So on the web, this means preferring HTML over CSS and CSS over JavaScript. Because your JavaScript can break. It can fail to load. It takes extra resources to download and run and it can exclude keyboard users and people using assistive technologies if you don't do it right. The reason is that JavaScript is a programming language, whereas CSS and HTML are declarative. With CSS and HTML, you tell the browser what to do instead of how to do it. The browser will figure out for you how to do it. Of course, your CSS can also fail to load, but all of you write amazing HTML, so your site will still be perfectly accessible. HTML really is the foundation. Do you have any, maybe it's... Keep on the pressure pad. <laughs> <laughs> so the good news is that browser makers are listening. They and specification writers are rapidly implementing stuff in CSS and HTML that up until a couple of years needed JavaScript. So that's what we'll be discussing today. But the larger point I want you to take away from this talk is that it's very tricky to learn something because once you've learned something, you don't have to learn it again. You already know it. So if in 2005 you learned how to implement a carousel using JavaScript, then that knowledge stays with you forever. It becomes part of your toolbox and every time you need to implement a carousel, you can just keep using the same thing because this is the web and everything that you build for the web is going to work forever. Caveats apply, but in general, all the crappy code you wrote a decade ago still runs in all the browsers. So there's never really a reason to learn something again because the old stuff still works for a given definition of works. So the techniques that I'll be teaching today and showing today are cool. But what I want you to take away from this is that just because you know something requires JavaScript, that knowledge may no longer be true. Just because you know something needs a specific browser hack, that may not be true anymore. You can make better websites if you check those assumptions every now and then. So let's get started. It's going to be a bit of a grab bag of features, new and old, some of 
them you might know, some of them you might not know. There's going to be a bunch of live demos on a dev device that's not my own. So expect stuff to break and if you can, please join me in laughter. So let's get started with something small, custom toggles. So when implementing custom toggles, we often reach for a JavaScript solution uh, you know, that handles the click events and keeps track of all the states of your toggle. But of course, we can do the same with an ordinary checkbox and the checked pseudo class. That means you can have fully interactive toggles. Is this getting worse? <laughs> you think? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> We'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, so we can have fully interactive toggles using CSS and native browser APIs, and that means that accessibility is done for you. Here on my next slide, oh, there we go. Uh, you can see the HTML that we're going to use. There's a label, inside the label is an input, it's of the type checkbox, and I describe what it is, it toggles my awesome feature. Now, this, using this instead of some JavaScript solution, is already giving us benefits because, because I can click anywhere inside the label and the browser has already realized that this entire label is linked to this input because I've put the input inside the label. And that means the entire thing is clickable without an on-click handler that I have to manage. So this is something the browsers already give us for free. Now, of course, I could say we're done here because it's, it's clearly a toggle. And that's nice if you're your own boss, but most of you will work with a designer. And if you show this to your designer and you say, I'm done, they say no. So we have to do a little bit more work. <clears throat> so we're going to add a ton of CSS and now it's a pretty toggle. What all this CSS does isn't super important except for that line on top which says appearance none. <clears throat> so appearance none is a way to tell the browser to please leave this element alone. You see form elements and images are something called replaced content. And that means that as your browser renders the HTML, they don't actually render something in the place of your form control. They leave a little space. They leave a little space for the image. They leave a little space for the input. <coughs> don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll put it. Um, it leaves a little space for the browser to replace it with native form controls with a thing that displays your image. Now this is great because the native form controls are provided by the operating system, they behave the same throughout it, etc. But they're also very hard to style because they're not of the web in a sense. With appearance none, you can tell the browser, you know, that's great, but please don't touch my inputs, please just let me handle everything. And that gives us additional powers because replaced content comes with a bunch of restrictions. One of them is that you can't really style everything about them, but also things like pseudo elements don't work in replaced content. While they work, you can put a before and an after element on uh, replaced content, but because before and after elements are part of the element and the entire element gets replaced, so does your after and before elements, they're gone. Now with appearance none, they come back. And that means that we have extra attributes or extra bits that we can style. So what I've done here is that the input is the background and the before element is the little nib in the toggle. <clears throat> and because we've used the same HTML, all of this is still perfectly interactive. So I can now click my thing, and as you can see, it's now checked. 
I mean, trust me, it's checked. <laughs> okay, so we need to do a little bit more work and this is where the checked pseudo element comes in. To make that change visible, we can use the checked pseudo element and this will match whenever the checkbox is, well, checked. So now as I click, again, anywhere in the label, that checked pseudo element starts to match and my background changes and the before element gets transformed. So there's one last thing to do because we have a very pretty custom toggle now that makes our designer very happy. Uh, we still have all the accessibility, but we need, we need to do a little bit more. Because <clears throat> we need to add an outline to the toggle when it's selected by the keyboard. But we prefer not to do that when we click it. You see the focus outline, and I'm sure there's people that are going to disagree with me on that, is there to help people know where they click or where the focus is. But if you already have a mouse and you click the thing, then you know the thing you clicked. So for that reason, a lot of people hide the outline. Please don't do that. Please keep the outline, but only when people interact with it with your keyboard, with their keyboard. Just a moment. There we go. So now as... <laughs> as I click it with my mouse, it's, it's clear that I clicked it. But now if I switch to the space bar, I get this really nice focus outline. And if you've been designing for, you know, more than, or building websites for more than five years, you probably know that the outline is this really ugly dotted black box around your elements that you can't style, you can't do anything about. But you can, because outline now follows the border radius. So that looks great by default. You can add an outline offset that can go outside of the elements, but also into the elements. <coughs> so you can have a much nicer outline that even your designer will be happy with. Now, one last, last thing is that even though we're all used to writing outline none, I want you to start writing outline color transparent instead. The result will be the same because with outline none, the outline isn't there because it's not there. And with outline color, the outline isn't there because it's invisible. But the difference is that when a user uses high contrast mode in Windows or forced colors, that outline is then visible again for people that want higher contrast. I don't have time to go into forced colors and what that actually is. So if you want to learn more about that, I wrote a very long blog post about it on polypane.app slash forced colors. Um, and, and with this, we've done, you know, everything you want to do for, for a custom toggle without touching any JavaScript. So while we're working with forms, it's time for a, for a quick one. Data list. So data list is the browser's built-in way to show a list of match suggestions as a user types into an input. It's an auto-suggest, but it's done by the browser instead of by a 400-line JavaScript library. It looks like this. There's an input and you provide it with a list attribute and that list attribute refers to the ID of a data list element. You can put the data list element anywhere on the page. It's not rendered, it's display none. So you don't have to worry about that. Now, as I start typing in the input, it suggests to me all the items from the data list and it automatically filters it down. I can even get an overview of all of them. And very important, I still have the option to create my own CSS framework. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So zero JavaScript, quite a lot of functionality. If you, if you haven't used this yet, try it out. In the same vein, instead of shipping like a huge JavaScript color picker with a nice canvas and a full UI, etc., you can let the browser handle it with an input type color. And the nice thing is, is that this actually gives your user more. So this shows the very nice canvas without you having to ship anything. But because it's the browser, it can actually pick colors from anywhere on the screen. Good luck doing that in JavaScript. And right now the entire screen is the browser, but this specific API also lets you pick colors from outside of the browser. It lets you pick colors from the entire display. So that's pretty neat. And you get it with literally a single line of HTML. It's very hard to beat that. One other thing I want to call out here is that this is an unstyled color input. And we're used to those being ugly white boxes. Whereas this is an ugly dark gray box. <laughs> and that's because I've used a color scheme dark to tell the browser that actually this design is in dark mode. So if you have replaced content, please provide me with dark mode input elements. And the browser then does that for us. Now, if you have a website that has both a dark and a light mode, you can instead say color scheme dark space light, and the browser will dynamically switch between the, their dark mode and light mode input elements for you. So again, saves you a bunch of code. Okay, two small examples. Let's go back to something a little bit more meatier. Uh, complex in-page transitions. So when moving from one section of a page to another, browsers jump by default, like they instantly go to the other part of the page. And this can be jarring and disorienting because you no longer know exactly where, on, where you are on the page, how far down are you, what's above it, what's below it. It's much nicer to scroll the user like gently take him to the next part of the, of the page so that they have a sense of where they are on the page. Now in the past we used jQuery for this with you know, just seven lines of gorgeous JavaScript and of course hundreds and hundreds of lines of jQuery in the background doing the actual work. Um, and you, you know, I really like this, I spent many years writing this, but you can forget it because even these seven lines, which aren't a lot, can be replaced by a single line of CSS, scroll behavior smooth. This tells the browser to always scroll smoothly when navigating to a fragment identifier, which is any ID on your page, essentially. And now every internal link is magically upgraded. The nice thing here is that whereas with jQuery, jQuery needed to decide how fast it should go, it needed to wait on the browser to make the animation happen, etc. Here, because CSS is declarative, the browser will figure out everything for you. It figures out how long the animation should take, it makes sure that there's like a decent FPS, uh, it can skip parts if it thinks that's good for the, the length of the animation. And that means that if you scroll behavior smooth, it's always snappy. It doesn't, uh, doesn't hang because there's some random other JavaScript process going on. Now, don't worry, you can still use this in JavaScript as well. Any of the scroll APIs have behavior as a potential option. So, you know, scroll to, scroll uh, into view, etc. And that still saves you a bunch of JavaScript. Now there's one important consideration here and that's accessibility. While for most people, it's the jumping from one part of the page to another part that can be jarring. People that have vestibular disorders, um, for them it's the scrolling that poses the problem because it can make them nauseous and unwell and there's a lot of motion that they prefer not to see. Now browsers have a way of catering to these users with prefers reduced motion. And the way to implement this is to see smooth scrolling 
as uh, as an added behavior. So by default, we choose the accessible uh, version, which is no smooth scrolling. And only when the user has said that they don't mind motion with prefers reduced motion, no preference, do we add the scroll behavior. So smooth. We have native smooth scrolling for the people that want that. We have no smooth scrolling for those that don't. And we're not shipping any CSS. Now that's a great start, but we can add a little bit more because what if we want to scroll to an element but keep a little headroom? For example, to make sure that our lovely fixed header doesn't overlap the title we just scrolled to. Well, CSS has a solution for that too, called scroll margin. It works the same as regular margin, but it's only applied when scrolling. And there's also scroll padding, which works the same. So now, if I go to my target, you can see that there's still space left above my target so that it doesn't fall under the header. Now, if I scroll back to top, I don't have a scroll margin there. And that means that while it's technically scrolled to the top, the top isn't actually readable because it's behind the header and I still have to scroll back. Now, this definitely beats manually subtracting the offset in JavaScript before its animation, right? Right? <laughs> Thanks. So as a finishing touch here, what if we want to highlight our target in some way to give it extra prominence? Of course, we could here use JavaScript to add a class to the target that then adds a transition, but there's a CSS solution for that as well called the target pseudo class. The target pseudo class matches whenever an element is the target, which is the result of clicking a link to its fragment identifier. So if I click to target here, now we get this lovely outline and we know that we definitely need to look at my middle title. So that means we've built a way to smoothly scroll to a specific section, highlight it and also keeping space for the rest of the UI. We're doing all of that without any JavaScript. Now in the previous couple of demos, you saw a header that was fixed to the top of the screen with position fixed. But position fixed is quite difficult to work with because by its very nature, it's taken out of your regular document flow and you really only have the viewport to position it against, which isn't always what you want. Now in CSS, you can now use position sticky, which behaves as a regular element until it hits certain uh, borders or edges like top, bottom, left and right. And then it becomes fixed like, it becomes sticky. So as I scroll these, you can see that this element, it scrolls along with the parent element until it reaches that top 50% and then it's stuck. This is the exact same CSS, but because the parent element started later, this one still is happily scrolling until it also gets stuck. Now they're stuck together. But as the parent element scrolls further along, you can see that it takes the child element along with it. And the browser takes care of all of the logic here. So definitely something you'll want to try instead of doing some random in-view JavaScript library. Now, what about this other staple of JavaScript scroll-related features? I'm talking about image carousels or sliders. For that, we have the scroll snap APIs. So with scroll snap, we can create sliders that snap their, to their parent elements in different ways while still accepting native scrolling. So I have a scroll snapping slider here and as I scroll, you can see that it just follows the mouse like any other scroller. And it's, it's only when I release the mouse that you can see that it, it snaps to whatever is closest. And this is the way it works. On the parent, you set a scroll snap type that takes two arguments, a direction, which is X and Y. 
It's not blocking in line because that would be consistent. It's X and Y. <laughs> and then you have to tell it how it should snap, which is either mandatory or proximity. So mandatory always snaps and proximity only when it's close enough to an edge. Which edge? Well, that's where scroll snap align on the child element comes in. That's where you tell it which side to snap on. There's start and there's end for in English left and right or center. And that start and end will switch if you use languages or pages in languages that use uh, different directions. Now, by changing the scroll snap align to center, we get center aligning. And I want you all to take a moment how you and think about how you would write the JavaScript to center align a randomly sized div in a scroller like this. Because notice that they're all slightly different sizes and the browser just takes care of it and we don't have to do any math at all. Yes, whoo! <laughs> Now, there's a lot of stuff you can do with scroll snapping. A whole range of very cool tricks. If you want to learn more, check out this presentation by Adam. Really goes into the nitty gritty of all the things you can do with scroll snapping. Now, on to accordions and modals. Two other elements that we very often solve with JavaScript that we can also just use HTML for. An accordion and a modal. Now, having an accordion on your page can really help you keep your content organized by showing the titles of sections and only expanding the full section when a user clicks on them and actually wants to read them. The HTML for this is details and summary and it implements exactly this. All content inside a details element is hidden except for the summary element until you click on the summary element and then the rest of the content is made visible. Now that's nice, but of course your designer designed your accordion such that the first one is open by default and you're out of luck here because it's closed by default. But don't worry, you can just add an open attribute to the details and now it's open. And if you write any sort of React or JavaScript framework, you're going to look at this and think, okay, well, now it's open forever because, you know, that's just how, how it works. Not in the browser. Because open is just the starting state. It's a dynamic attribute. So I can still click it to close it. The browser gives us a ton of stuff for free. Okay, back to the designer. He or she is going to hate that triangle. Not for any particular reason, just they didn't design it. <laughs> so it's clearly the wrong triangle. Don't worry, there's CSS for that too, with the marker pseudo element. The marker pseudo element only takes a subset of CSS, so you can't go wild with it, but you can still si style the sizing and the content. For example, we can have these two emoji and then of course use that open attribute to show a different emo emoji when uh, the dialogue or the, the details is actually open without having to do any sort of listeners. Now a gotcha here is that though a summary is clickable like a link or a button, it doesn't have any indication that it's clickable, like a link or a button. It doesn't get an underline. It doesn't have big chunky borders. So I think we need to help users along here. And I'm, I don't want to get into the only link should have pointer cursors discussion, but you should at least do something to make sure that people know that this thing is something you can click on and then stuff happens. Okay, on to dialogue. For this one, I'm going to cheat a little bit since it does need some JavaScript. So the dialogue element in HTML is like a better confirm or a better alert. 
It implements a modal dialog for you, but what it doesn't do is lock the main thread. So your page can still do stuff while you show a dialog. It automatically helps keep focus inside the dialog. It prevents Z index issues and it also handles closing the element for you. So this is what the dialog looks like, because by default it's hidden. Um, so to create it, you create a dialog element, then inside it you put a form with a method of dialog. This is like a new thing, because before we only really had methods post. And I'll explain why we want this form in a bit. And now to show it, we need to call a function on this dialog, which is either show for a non-modal dialog or show modal for a modal dialog. The difference being that a non-modal dialog opens in place and a modal dialog opens across the entire page. So that works like this. You click the button, the modal shows. But there's no close button here. So how do we get out of it? I also can't click next to it because there's no listeners here. Well, that's where the form comes in. So whenever you click a button in the form that submits that form, the browser will see that as... <laughs> <laughs> nice. As a close event. And that's how you can implement uh, a confirmation dialog. Now, if you have any other form data in there, you can add a listener to the dialog and listen to the close event to get the actual value of whichever button, whichever button you clicked. So now we have two buttons and one is correct and the other isn't. And then in, on the close uh, event listener, you can listen to dialog.returnValue. If it happens again during a demo, I'm just going to say, trust me, bro. <laughs> Lastly, you can also style, uh, trust me, bro. <laughs> you can also style the backdrop, which is the layer between the dialog and the rest of the page. Container queries are also a thing that you no longer need JavaScript for, and I would be remiss not to mention them, but they would fill up all the time I don't actually have left anymore. So I'm just gonna say there are a bunch of really excellent resources to learn about them. Um, they haven't been around for very long, but they're in every browser now. Unlike the next few bits, which aren't yet in browsers, but will be soon, hopefully, fingers crossed. One of them is uh, masonry layout. So instead of using Packery or masonry or some other huge JavaScript library to get the Pinterest layout, you can also use the grid template rows masonry CSS to get that. It's available in Firefox behind the feature flag. It's in Safari's technology preview. I hope Chrome is shipping it soon as well. And you can find more information on the link on the screen. <laughs> I can wiggle it, but... Uh, we'll share the slides, right? Yeah. yeah. I'll just plug it out and plug it back in, back in again. That always works. works. <laughs> Guess I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so I, I, I had another bit about the select list element, which is extremely exciting because it lets you do a completely stylable select without screwing everyone that doesn't use a mouse. Um, and it's coming and it's great and it works wonderful. Uh, the has pseudo uh, function, CSS pseudo function that lets you select any other element on the page 
and query that to determine the style of a random element. It's already in Chrome uh, and in Safari. And just this week, Firefox Nightly enabled it as well. So that's coming very, very soon, like ready for use. And then I had this really cool demo by uh, Brahmus. about scroll-driven animations, which I was just gonna show, as in look at this amazing thing that doesn't do any, uh, doesn't need any JavaScript. And that's it. <laughs> Thanks everyone. <laughs> I hope you, uh, you enjoyed this. <laughs>